Here we're going to make resistance and reactance diagrams for for a variety of here we're going to make resist we can plot resistance and reactance as vectors in a complex number plane using the mathematics of imaginary numbers. Below are two types of circuits that we've looked at so far. The RL circuit contains a resistor and an inductor. The RC circuit contains a resistor and a capacitor. When we represent the reactance and the resistance as vectors, if resistance points directly to the right, we get different phasor diagrams depending on whether we're talking about an RL or RC circuit. Sometimes the reactance is an inductive reactance, and sometimes it's a capacitive reactance. Now one reason why these diagrams are useful is that they correspond to the voltage phasors across these different components. So we can create a similar diagram to the one on the left where it doesn't represent resistance and reactance and impedance, but instead we'll have the voltage of the resistor, the voltage of the inductor, and the voltage of the source. And we can use the mathematics of phasors to predict what the voltage of any of these components will be at any given time. If we're talking about an RC circuit, then what we'll have is we'll still have the voltage of the resistor pointing to the right when we set up the diagram. We'll have the voltage of the capacitor 90 degrees behind the resistor. And the voltage of the source can be something between. An even more complicated type of circuit would be an RLC circuit. This is a circuit with a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. When this happens, both the inductor and the capacitor can contribute reactants to the overall circuit. In order to find out which one is providing more reactants, we can actually sum the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants together as vectors to find one total reactance, and that would be just x. Now impedance, z, is actually going to be a complex sum of r plus x where R is the real resistance, and X is an imaginary component. And so you might be wondering, well, what's imaginary about it? Now, they're both measured in ohms, of course, but we're going to attach an imaginary number to X the imaginary number i. i is the square root of negative 1. Sometimes people will assign j1 instead of i to avoid confusion with electron current. When we do our formula for the magnitude of impedance, we're going to have to combine the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants into one reactance. Here's an example. The diagram on the right shows an RL circuit. There's a resistor and an inductor. The resistor's resistance is 5 ohms. And our inductance is 10 millihenries, which is 0 0.01 henries. Let's calculate the reactance of the inductor. Now, inductive reactance has the formula omega times L. It could also be written as 2 pi F times L.
So let's plug in. I get 3.77 ohms. But one thing that's new here is we're actually going to express the reactants as an imaginary number. To do that, we can attach an I at the end or a J, which stand for an imaginary number. Now we want to make a phasor diagram showing the resistance and reactance and impedance of the RL circuit as vectors. But these are going to be vectors in what's called a complex number plane. The horizontal direction is the real component, and the vertical is going to be the imaginary. All right, so what goes in the real direction is the resistance. So that's R equals 5 ohms. In the imaginary direction, we'll put the reactants, X, 3.77 ohms J. Now the reason we know the reactants points up is because it has the J. It's the imaginary component of the impedance. The impedance is the vector sum of both of these. That's Z. It's R plus XL. Which can also be written as 5 ohms plus 3.77 ohms J. The J keeps it separate so that this is the vertical component and this is the horizontal. Note that this is an RL circuit and when that happens we need our XL to be 90 degrees ahead of the resistance. Another thing we can do with this is make a phasor diagram for the voltage across each of the components, the inductor, the source, and the resistor. It's just going to have the same basic shape as the diagram on the left. So the resistance here will correspond to the voltage across the resistor. The inductive reactance will correspond to the voltage across the inductor. And the impedance corresponds to the voltage across the source. These things can help us track what the voltage of each component is as time goes on. Now we'd like to find the phase difference between the resistor voltage and the source voltage. That's this angle here. It's going to be the same angle in both diagrams. To find it, we'll use the formula that the phase difference will be the arctan of the reactance over the resistance. So, our phase difference will be the tan inverse of x over r, which is the tan inverse of 3.77 over 5. It's about 37 degrees. Finally, our goal is to plot the voltage waveforms for each component these mathematics will ensure that Kirchhoff's loop law is always obeyed. Well, first of all, notice that the voltage of the resistor is pointing 
at a standard position angle of zero degrees. So we could start there. We could say that in this picture above, the resistor voltage is in a phase of zero. The source voltage then is in a phase of 37 degrees, whereas the inductor is in a phase of 90 degrees. So if I start with the resistor voltage, I can just start right here at time zero and make a nice sine wave. Now I want to label that as the resistor voltage. It could also be helpful to label the axis in terms of angles. So this would be zero degrees as a phase angle, 90 degrees, 180, and 270. The reason I'm saying this is the inductor voltage is going to be 90 degrees ahead of the resistor voltage. So what does this mean? It means that if the resistor voltage peaks here, then your inductor voltage needed to peak 90 degrees before that. That's what it means to be ahead. What's going to end up happening here is we want to set up three functions. One of them is for the resistor voltage. It's going to be a function of time. And the form of it is going to be VR peak times the sine of omega t. Even though we can find the omega here, the peak resistor voltage is tougher to find. It turns out that it is not going to be necessarily 10 volts. In an RLE circuit, things are a little bit more complicated. Part of the voltage can be in the resistor at any given time, and part of the voltage could be across the inductor. So we're going to have to do a little work to find out how high that resistor voltage actually goes. If we know that, then we can put a value in here for VR peak. We're also going to want to create a function for the voltage across the inductor. So that's going to be VL peak times the sine of not just omega t, but the inductor leads by 90 degrees. So we have to shift this function. And then we have our voltage across the source. So we'll have Vs peak times sine of omega t plus 37. These are the functions that we'd like to graph, but the tough part is finding each of these peaks. Well, one of them is not so tough, actually. We know what the peak source voltage is. It's going to be 10 volts. Let's put in some numbers for omega. Omega will be given by 2 pi f. So for this circuit, let's see, it's 2 pi times 60. And that's 120 pi radians per second. So let's go ahead and put that in here. 
Now, all we have left to find is the peak inductor voltage and the peak resistor voltage. All right, so one option for these. So in the past, we would have used the formula VR peak equals I peak times the resistance. But for the inductor, what we should use is VL peak equals I peak times X. And these will work out well. The only problem is we have to find the peak current now as well. Then we'll be able to calculate these. So how do you find the peak current? So we're going to need one more formula. That's that the peak voltage of the source equals peak current times the impedance. Since this is a circuit that contains both resistance and reactance, we should do that. So if we go back and look at our Z, the impedance, it was given as 5 ohms plus 3.77 ohms J. We're going to want to find the magnitude of that impedance. So we'll use the formula square root of R squared plus X squared. So 5 ohms squared plus 3.77 ohms squared. It's about 6.26 ohms. So let's plug that in for Z. And we should put in 10 volts for the peak source voltage. The peak current is about 1.6 amps. So now we can take that result and plug it into these formulas here to find out how large each of these voltages go. So we'll have VR peak equals 1.6 amps times 5 ohms. So our resistor will have a peak voltage of approximately 8 volts. When it comes to the inductor, its peak voltage will be 1.6 amps times 3.77 ohms. So it will get 6 volts. So these are the three things we need to complete the graph. The peak source voltage is 10 volts. The peak resistor voltage is only 8 volts. And the inductor has 6 volts of peak voltage. We can go back to our formulas and plug the others in. Now this will give us a sense of what the drawing should look like. 
and you could certainly plug it into desmos.com to see it if you have trouble drawing it freehand. So in Desmos, we just want to type in each of these formulas. Now we're going to have to scale the axes here, clearly. All right, so our voltage can go from negative 10 to 10. That's the highest value that we'll get. And for this, we're going to have to zoom in. All right, so there's a good picture of our resistor voltage as a function of time. So it starts off at zero volts. It's going to go up to a peak of eight. And then it'll come back to zero, and then it'll go to negative eight, and that's as high as it goes. The reason it doesn't go all the way up to 10 is because there's an inductor in the circuit which requires some of the voltage. Let's put in the inductor function. Now, when it comes to this program, you're going to want to convert your angle to radians. It's not going to understand degrees. So we'll do times pi over 180. That would fix it. Or 2 pi over 360 works just as well. And look at that. So it is true that our inductor voltage leads the resistor voltage by a phase difference of 90 degrees. The inductor voltage peaks before the resistor voltage, and that's what we want. Now let's include the source as well. And there's the source. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Beautiful. So as we can see, when a circuit is not just purely capacitive or purely resistive or purely inductive, then the different voltages are going to be out of phase with each other. But they do have one thing in common. Here's what it is. Let's make sure that all of these are functions of time. What they have in common is Kirchhoff's loop law is always true. That the voltage across the source has to equal the sum of the resistor voltage plus the inductor voltage. So as you can see, if I add the resistor voltage and inductor voltage together, the purple curve that they make totally overlaps the source voltage. And you can see that if you look closely here, how the source voltage at this particular time is 6 volts. But at that time, the inductor has all the voltage. Then we go to the peak of the source. At the peak of the source, it's 10 volts. And the sum of these two equals that 10. If you look at this point, our source comes back to 8 volts, but none of it comes from the inductor at that time. At that time, the voltage is all across the resistor. And so that's the graph that we want to draw here. Our resistor peak was 8. 
our inductor peak was 6. But at 0, our inductor is going to have all the voltage. Okay, so now we can draw, and it'll come down to 0 at 90 degrees. It'll go to negative 6 here. And we'll come back to 0 and back to positive 6. That is the voltage of the inductor. It leads the resistor by 90 degrees. The source is perhaps the most difficult one to draw. But one option is to use the phase angle here. Notice that the source leads the resistor by 37 degrees. So its peak will happen here, 37 degrees behind the resistor's peak. Not only that, but we can see that the inductor has all the voltage at this time. So that's going to be a point for our source as well. Same thing for this point and this point. this point and that point and we're starting to create a kind of sine wave graph that we could plot notice that the resistors voltage is zero here so the source would also be zero 37 degrees prior to that same thing would happen here all right so we're getting a pretty good idea of what this guy will look like. All right, that is the voltage of the source. It's going to have a maximum of 10 and a minimum of negative 10. And it's done.